Warm greetings and a very good afternoon to all viewers. Welcome to our Masa University webinar series. Today's, today's webinar is hosted by Faculty of Dentistry, Masa University. The topic for today's lecture series is Robotics in Adenex Surgery. Robotic surgery, otherwise called as robot assisted surgery, allows doctors to perform many types of complex procedures with more precision, flexibility, and more control than with conventional techniques. Robotic surgery is usually associated with minimally invasive surgery. The guest speaker for today's webinar is Ms. Nazim Ghazali. In this talk, Ms. Nazim Ghazali shares with us her pioneering work with robotics in maxillofacial surgery. Ms. Nazim Ghazali is, a, is currently a consultant oral and maxillofacial surgeon, head and neck oncology and reconstructive surgeon, Blackburn Hospitals, United Kingdom. She is also a honorary senior lecturer, School of Medicine, University of Central Lancashire, United Kingdom, visiting professor, University of Malaya and Massa University. Ms. Nazim Ghazali is duly qualified in dentistry and medicine. She completed her BDS from University of Malaya, Malaysia, did her MBBS from London, doctorate in medicine from Liverpool, Diploma in Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery from UK. She completed a maxillofacial surgery training in Eastman Dental Hospital London, then in University of California, King's College and Guy's Hospitals. She undertook a clinical research fellowship in Head and Neck Oncology at Aintree University Hospitals Liverpool. She also completed a surgical fellowship in Head and Neck Oncology and Reconstructive Surgery at University of Maryland, Baltimore. Ms. Ghazali is a research and development lead of the maxillofacial department at East Lancashire Hospitals. Her research interest is in head and neck cancer, transoral robotic surgery, and oral precancerous conditions. Ms. Ghazali has received research grants for this area of work. She has published many research papers in peer reviewed journals and contributed book chapters also. Ms. Ghazali, we are honored to have you with us today. Welcome, welcome to our webinar series, Miss. Now the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm really, really pleased to be here. And um, because the timing of the webinar is quite tight, what I've done is I've uh, prepared a lecture that's recorded so that I would keep to time because we are speaking about a subject that's really interesting to me and I can sometimes overrun. So, um, however, I will be here um, throughout the lecture and I look forward to uh, meeting with all of you again at the end of the lecture um, for any questions uh, and discussions. Okay. Thank you, Professor Rosna, for inviting me to speak today and Professor Kumar for your very kind introduction. Good morning, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, in the next hour, I will share with you some insights I've gained from my experience uh, in doing head and neck robotic surgery in the last six years. Before I start, I'd like to say that I do not have any conflict of interest and all the cl clinical material in this presentation have come from my patients whose consent I've obtained. In my talk today, I will briefly discuss the paradigm shift that has occurred in the practice of surgery through the introduction of minimal access surgery and its natural progression into robotic surgery. I will also showcase some of the day-to-day -day head and neck robotic surgery work that I do, enabled by the state-of-the-art robotic surgical system that I've had the privilege of pioneering in my hospital. Having gained the experience using this system in the last few years, I would also like to share some of the ideas that I have explored um, in aspects of surgical innovation, training and education of future surgeons in robotic surgery. As head and neck surgeons, we spend long hours in the operating theatre. And at the core of this activity is an emphasis on performance of the highest technical quality. To achieve this, we must be able to see the target area very clearly, and so good access is paramount. We do this by performing open surgery, by making incisions and cuts through skin, soft tissue and bone to visualize the target area. 
Um, and mind you, this, this, at this point, we haven't actually done any surgery yet. We're just, doing surg we're just doing some parts of the surgery in order to be able to see what we're going to be doing um, that we've planned. Unfortunately, these cuts that we make um, are often through layers of healthy tissue, which are consequently injured and destroyed in the process. This collateral damage is what makes open surgery highly invasive. Surgery to the head and neck is generally considered difficult and problematic because some of the target areas are poorly accessible and therefore difficult to visualize. This boils down to the naturally complicated anatomy of the region, which is usually uh, made up of um, individual um, subsites. The upper airway and digestive tract is composed of the oral cavity, the pharynx, larynx, the nasal cavity, and the sinuses. In my practice, I tend to see mainly cancers of the oral cavity and the pharynx. The oral cavity is made up of distinct sites, which you can see labeled in the diagram. Visualization and access to these areas can be obstructed by shadows created by naturally occurring curvatures in the oral cavity, the inward collapsing of adjacent soft tissues, the presence of teeth, and especially in those who have restricted mouth opening as shown in the slide. The pharynx and larynx are even trickier areas to visualize because they sit behind and below the oral cavity. Generally, the pharynx and larynx can only be examined using a camera. So if you take a look at the red line, um, it shows the path of the camera um, as it enters the nose, uh, nasal cavity and passes back to show the view of um, the posterior aspect of the nose and then it turns 90 degrees downwards to show um, the area of the pharynx, the epiglottis and the larynx. You can see the complexity of the area. It has a lumen and the luminal walls are collapsible and the view is made even more difficult by the presence of saliva and mucus. Poor access and difficulties with visualization suggests that access surgery is required in uh, situations more often than not um, to gain access in the head and neck. However, in the head and neck, there are lots of critical and important anatomical structures, which you can see on the slide, and these can be significantly injured and damaged as we create um, access to the target area. Recovery from highly invasive open surgery in the head and neck is unsurprisingly associated with significant morbidity, protracted recovery times and longer hospital stay, which is all bad news for the patient. Head and neck cancer is the sixth most common cancer worldwide. In most head and neck cancer, surgery is the treatment of choice, provided that surgery can remove the cancer completely or what we call surgical, resect, surgically resectable. The aim of surgery is to remove the cancer completely, and we do that by placing a one centimeter margin around all aspects of what we can see as the cancer. In these resectable cancers, open access is often needed because, as I've said, we do need to see the cancer properly and completely so that we can then place the correct surgical margins around the cancer. One of the most critical considerations in head and neck cancer surgery is the amount of tissue damage that can occur when we remove the cancer. It's probably correct in saying that unfortunately, head and neck cancer is a cruel disease because surgery to treat this cancer inevitably and significantly affects the fundamental components that define us as human beings. Our face, we have facial deformity, altered speech and eating function, which are basic human functions, they can be irreversible following surgery, and this can be quite devastating. So even if the patient is saved and is alive, um, their quality of life can be significantly affected. So you can say, what is the point of living when I can't actually live? Therefore, minimizing the impact of surgery without compromising cancer care is what I try to achieve for my patients. A paradigm shift has occurred with the introduction of the minimally invasive surgical approach. There are three important aspects of this approach, as you can see on the slide. But the fundamental shift is the idea that the access for the procedure is obtained through natural openings in the body, or it is minimized by making smaller incisions, thereby reducing collateral tissue damage, 
and obtaining better surgical outcomes for patients. Head and neck minimally invasive surgery consists of procedures which are endoscopically based. And this is used for diagnosis as well as treatment. The access is obtained through a natural opening, anatomical opening, i.e. the mouth, and therefore the approach is called transoral approach. And we use various endoscopes uh, for this purpose, and they can be uh, ones which rely on normal vision, ones which have microscopic magnification, some scopes tend to be rigid, and some scopes are flexible. Occasionally, we may be able to combine the scope work with instrumentation, um, and in that situation, we are uh, able to undertake some uh, limited um, types of surgery um, in the head and neck. However, it, it's, it's a problem because um, there are some difficulties uh, with endoscopic surgery. As a surgeon who undertakes endoscopic surgery, I'm very um, aware of how limited, how constricted the space, my operating space is. Um, it's worse because the luminal structures still collapse despite the fact that we can access to it. Um, and I can't really see very well. I can't see past the corners. I can't see the, some, of, some of the curvatures. Um, when I can see, I find that the vision is monoocular, it is not stereoscopic, which means that I don't see things in 3D, and because of that, there is loss of perception. So when you put instruments in, it exact, doesn't act, exactly go where you think it should go uh, because of the loss of perception. Furthermore, um, the next problem is the hand-to-eye coordination, the skills that we obtain and we learn um, the normal hand-to-eye coordination through open surgery is not applicable in endoscopic surgery. And so um, you have to relearn how to do things um, endoscopically. This often adds to operating times, which means that patients are under general anesthesia for much longer than they ought to be. Um, it can, you know, it's time consuming and therefore cost consuming. Um, uh, the difficulty as well um, relates to how some of the movements that you need to do with um, endoscopic work is counterintuitive. It's not naturally how you would do things, and therefore um, all of these um, make endoscopic surgery not really um, something that most people would go for um, and difficult. However, this is where robotic surgery has been a game changer because the robotic technology that comes, the digital advancement with engineering in terms of what you can see, the magnification and also the instrumentation um, has allowed um, all of the challenges which I've listed to be overcome. So therefore, really with robotic surgery, what can be achieved is that you can undertake the same kind of surgery, the degree of um, radical treatment and safety of the procedure that you have with open surgery can be undertaken using the robot with no difference, but can be done with the same ease and same accuracy, but without the degree of collateral damage that you see with open surgery, which I've highlighted previously. So transoral head and neck robotic surgery approach or TORS was originally introduced in 2009 um, in America. So this was eight years after um, the robot achieved FDA approval for um, other types of surgery, including urology, cardiothoracics and gynae. In the UK, the first TORS was undertaken in 2011. I undertook my first TORS um, in 2016 uh, when I established the robotic service in the hospital. Um, to date, I have about 105 cases, uh, and hopefully it's uh, counting. Currently, there are two robotic systems used in head and neck surgery, the Da Vinci robotic system and the Med Robotics Flex robotic system. Um, the Da Vinci robotic system has the larger market share because of its vir by virtue of it being the first robotic system uh, in the world. Um, having received the FDA approval in 2001. There are more than 6,000 robots installed worldwide. Um, and the vast majority of it is in America. In the UK, there are probably about 120 to 150 robots installed currently, and I expect the count to be rising with the COVID pandemic now officially declared over in the UK. In terms of surgical specialty, Urology is, are the highest users of the robotic system. It's not just in the UK, but worldwide. 
um, head and neck surgery, which is in purple, as you can see, accounts for a much smaller proportion of cases done worldwide. Um, but the numbers are increasing annually. This slide shows the distribution of hospitals in the UK that offer the transoral robotic service. The Da Vinci robotic system has three components. The surgeon's console, where I sit remotely, which means away from the patient. The patient side cart, which is what most people would imagine the robot is, which sits uh, next to the patient. And the vision cart, which houses the image processing equipment and the energy settings of the robotic instruments. The relationship between the surgeon and the robot is one of a master and slave, which means that the surgeon who sits at the surgeon's console is in complete control of the robotic movements and the camera at any time. Um, the robot is currently not automators. The patient side cart, as I said, is what most people imagine the robot to be. Um, just like car models, you know, there are upgrades. Um, the one that you see at the far um, left is the SI system, which was the original system. Um, we have now an upgrade into the X uh, system. In the middle is the X and the far right is XI. Um, uh, there are some improvements, but generally speaking, they retain the same characteristics, which is that it's multi-armed or multi-port system. Um, we've got four arms. Um, one arm is usually the designated camera arm and the remaining arms are the instruments arm. Um, the robotic camera is a 3D high definition camera. Um, if you look at the slide at the tip end of the camera, you can see one eye, which is the right eye and the left eye. So it, it takes um, images separately and the computer of the robot merges the images together to provide a 3D picture that you see um, at the surgeon's console. This is no different from our own eyes. Um, the right eye and the left eye gets different types of images and the brain merges it together and you have a 3D rendering of what you see um, in the environment. In terms of the instrument arms, you have the endoris instrument um, mounted on top of it. Um, the endoris comes in two sizes, the five millimeters, which are used with the SI system and the eight millimeters, which is used with the X and the XI. Um, there are several designs of the endorists at the end, at the end of the endorists. So you have um, something like the grasper which uh, or pro grasper which um, holds on to um, heavier tissues you have the needle driver design here um, and you also have um, scissors and um, also um, monopolar cutting um, uh, tips um, in different type different shapes um, sorry different um, shapes you have a spatula shape and you have sometimes like a hook shape so the endorists, they are pretty amazing. Um, the design and the engineering has allowed routine tasks to be performed very, very safely and accurately within a small limited working space. The range of movement of the endorists is more than what a normal wrist can do, thereby enabling impossible surgical maneuvers or movements to be achieved. Um, also, the endorists are energized, so it means that you can cut using the endorist um, instrumentation and you can have electrocautery, harmonics, um, or even lasers um, attached to these um, devices. Um, these can overall, with the magnification um, and 3D visualization, help to maintain a bloodless field and you can see better. The surgeon's console is the master unit of the robotic system. Um, using haptic technology, the robot master controller takes input from my hands at the finger clutch and translates these movements in real time, but scaled down um, to micro movements at the endorist instrumentation in the patient's uh, mouth um, in the surgical field. Um, together with tremor reduction, um, it eliminates the natural tremor that everybody has uh, therefore, motions end together with the motion scaling allows for precision work to be done. So the foot paddle, which I've circled in the slide, enables me to uh, change the movements of the camera and to alternate between the right side, left side, uh, electrocautery, energy um, instrumentation. The display system allows me to see the surgical field through the console binoculars. The view that I can see through this is a 3D stereoscopic high definition display, which allows up to 10 times magnification, retaining true depth perception 
which means I can see the tissue planes very, very clearly. I can identify the structures correctly. And this keeps me orientated all the time in the person's anatomy. Uh, there will be a couple of videos of tours which will demonstrate the magnification and the high quality images of, um, that I can see. Uh, however, unfortunately, you will not be able to appreciate the 3D um, effect of these um, images uh, like I would when I sit at the surgeon's console because what you will be seeing is essentially a 2D image. I'd like to share with you a short clip of um, the operating theatre in a tourist case. Um, and the image, well, um, you can see that there are trolleys with endorist instruments, camera, and the retractors which are used during surgery. The robot that you can see in the theatre is an SI model, which has now uh, been replaced by a newer X model. In TORS, we use only three robotic arms, and the fourth arm is usually tucked away at the back. The robotic arms have slots um, for cannulas that house the endorist instruments, which we talked about previously. Um, the robot is draped to ensure a sterile environment as well as protecting the 1.2 million pounds investment of the device. Um, the patient is then brought through to the operating theatre already intubated. Um, you'll see that I will prepare the patient by protecting their eyes, the teeth, um, and also I will place the retractors in the mouth so that it keeps the mouth open and so the transoral um, access is stable and reliable throughout the surgery. Um, once I'm happy with all of that, then we move the robot next to the patient, in, um, we position it uh, in a precise way called docking the robot. It's quite um, tricky. Uh, it's far harder than side parking um, a car, I tell you. Um, so once the robot's positioned perfectly, I will sit at my patient surgeon's console, which is remotely or away from the patient. I have a quick chat with my assistant about the plan of action. Um, he sits um, next to the patient. His job is to help with facilitating the surgery by providing suctioning and additional retraction. Um, so I have conversations with my assistant throughout the surgery that we normally would, um, which is um, aided with a, a microphone um, near my console and speakers at the robot end. I think my robot assistant has the harder work because he can't see what he's doing inside the mouth and has to look at, turn his head um, to one side and look at the vision cart 2D imaging to see what he needs to do to help me. Um, so I guess, um, you know, I think he has the harder job compared to me because I sit at my console quite comfortably with 3D imaging and then I shout at him and tell him what he needs to do and where he needs to go. So we have a bit of fun uh, in the operating theatre. Um, the robotic platform allows surgeons to undertake minimally invasive head and neck surgery. So the established practice of TORS at the moment is for head and neck cancer and for sleep apnea. But as you become more accustomed using the robot, just like any other tool, you become proficient and you can see how it can be used in other areas. So surgeons naturally want to innovate um, technically um, and um, having had some experience using the robot, uh, I have now moved into trying to use a robot in, minim in benign um, um, type of work, for example, using transoral uh, robotic access for salivary gland, benign salivary gland disease, um, and also exploring um, the opportunity to undertake scarless thyroid surgery with a transoral approach uh, using the robot. Um, so the first slide here, or the first case that I'm going to show you on the robotic platform is how we moved away from um, open access surgery to minimally invasive uh, or access surgery using the robotic system. Um, TORS has certainly changed the way we manage early stage oropharyngeal cancers. Um, here is a case um, that's suitable for transoral robotic surgery. It is a small uh, early left tonsillar cancer. You struggle to see it because it's just tucked away at the side of the patient. In the traditional surgical approach in the management of tonsillar cancer, we need to access the tonsil first. So in order for it to be visualized adequately, we would have to cut through normal uh, lower jaw and neck structures um, through the skin um, and soft tissue of um, these areas to expose the bone, which is then drilled 
um, so that it's separated and then the bone can then, um, section of the bone can then be swung upwards and outwards so that we can then see the tonsil cancer which is circled in yellow. So at this point in time, even though the surgery looks quite extensive, we haven't actually removed the cancer yet. What we've done so far is to simply visualize the cancer properly. So once we've removed the cancer, um, then there's additional procedures that we need to do because we have created a communication between the back of the mouth and the neck where the major structures are. So we would have to put in um, tissue that we've borrowed from somewhere else to close that defect. So overall, this type of surgery is highly invasive. Even though this type of surgery, the access that we've undertaken called the lip split mandibulotomy was described more than 200 years ago, it is still currently being used today. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's time that we would shift our minds from doing something, you know, as medieval as this into something more advanced and uh, modern. So this is a case of an 80-year-old man who has left tonsil cancer early stage. Okay, this is um, a 2D view of what I would normally see as 3D in my surgeon's console. Here the view of the patient is magnified 10 times. Um, at the console, what I see is as if I've been transported to the back of the patient's throat, but everything's magnified 10 times. Um, here at the top end, you can see what instruments are being used, displayed on the system. Um, on the right hand, I've got the uh, Maryland retractor, and on the left hand, I've got the monopolar um, cautery. Uh, let me help to orientate you. Here's the superior part of the tonsil, and um, where it meets the soft palate. Here is the inferior part of the tonsil, where it meets the tongue base, and here are the sides of the tonsil, um, buccally, and here is the pharyngeal wall. So um, I begin by inspecting the tumor, lifting it up to see the back end. Hello, everybody. Uh, I've got a message from my laptop that says that my computer will go to sleep if I do not plug it to the power outlet. So I'm going to apologize and rush to get my power cable. So I should be back in about five minutes. I do apologize. Okay, so um, Prof Kumar has saved my life. So hopefully I will uh, carry on with my video. And, and I'm now placing a one centimeter margin around um, the cancer. I start usually by um, dissecting the top end or the superior pole of the tonsil and extend on the medial and lateral aspect of the tonsil tissue. Here is at the pterygo mandibular raphe. I'm looking at this area for the deep margin in the peripharyngeal space. So at the back end here is, um, so uh, you can see the important blood vessels which I've placed um, clips. Um, I extend um, the margin down to the inferior aspect um, and, it, and this area here, um, it is very difficult to see, um, and it's the instrumentation of the um, endoris instruments that help me um, gain access to this area. Um, so this area here is where um, the endoris instrument allows me to make the um, cuts uh, using an abnormal um, wrist movement um, which normally we wouldn't be able to use um, with our normal wrist. So this movement over there. So now just um, I'm finishing up um, the inferior and deep part of um, the dissection. And you can see um, the tissues 
uh, are very, very clear. So cancer is now completely removed. I'm just orientating it to make sure that um, we get good markings for the pathologist. So at the end of the procedure, what I'm doing now is um, uh, closing um, some of the defect at the top end by placing some stitches. Um, this is because um, there would be a large area of um, exposed um, tissue that would heal by secondary intention. So bleeding is one of the risk factors for procedures such as this. We don't traditionally put a flap in. So um, you can see that the um, end endo risk instrumentation allows us to undertake very precise work in a very limited workspace. Um, so what you can see here is um, uh, tying of the knot. So generally speaking, if you were to tie this in open surgery, you would get feedback of how much force to, to put. But with the robot, you don't get that feedback. And all the feedback that you get is predominantly what you can see. So uh, that's one of the most interesting things um, with robotic surgery um, that we've had to kind of um, learn and, and uh, understand as we go along. Um, so the next case I'm going to show is an example of what precise work we can do with um, the... So this is a 62-year-old lady who was referred to me for significant snoring and apnea, which was identified when she went for an OGD for acid reflux. The scan here shows the presence of a lipoma, which is a benign fat tumor that's located in the posterior pharyngeal wall, which was bulging forward to the point that it was touching the uvula of a soft palate. The axial section of the scan shows that the lipoma is located right up against the internal carotid artery. So, you know, we know we're going to be dealing with a pathology that's quite close to the internal carotid artery, which is a main blood supply to the brain. In the coronal section, uh, you can see septation within the uh, lipoma, which indicates that this lipoma could be an intramuscular lipoma. Um, this uh, suggests that during the procedure itself, we wouldn't be able to remove the lipoma in a single blob, but in fact, it's good, probably going to come up in fragments. And when it does that, uh, and muscles involved, there's probably going to be some amount of bleeding. So here's the actual um, surgical video. Uh, let me orientate. You can see uh, the bulge in the posterior pharyngeal wall, and the top bit there is the uvula. You can see how close it is to the uvula. Um, this is the SI system, this is my, only my second case um, um, in doing robotic surgery. So um, let's start the case. Um, so the incision is made um, over the mucosa. Um, it's very pre the pre um, preciseness um, and the tumor filtration and uh, the motion scaling allows this surgery to achieve that preciseness. Um, the dissection is clean, relatively bloodless. You can now just about see the start of the lipoma. And in the top corner, the 12 o'clock position of the incision, you can see something pulsating. Now, that's the internal carotid artery. That's how close it is. But, you know, you can feel fairly confident that you won't injure the artery if you didn't intend to because of the precision of the work. And there's no tremor. There's no accidental cutting unless you have actually um, cut into it. So as we... Um, you know, further um, um, dissect the tissue, you can see that it starts to come out in bits, which was predicted by the scan. It's a bit more bleeding than you would normally expect, but you know, you can get good control with hemostatic agents. Um, Monocortary, monopolar, and bipolar. He got bipolar there, and I've placed some adrenaline so it goes to the area, and it's really very well. Um, controlled based on hemostatic um, surgery cell in there, you can see the pulsation. Now, the, the precision work as well allows you to do this kind of work uh, in a confined space, knowing that there are important anatomical structures there, um, and you're likely, unlikely to injure them as long as you, know, you, you precisely do what you want to do, the, the, the robot will deliver that for you. So again, you know, um, the stitch work here, you can see um, the amount of um, uh, force that you apply uh, is really an understanding of what you can see to the eye rather than what you can feel because you can't feel um, uh, the, the pressure. Uh, 
Um, finally, Scarlet surgery on the robotic platform. So this is something that I've developed having uh, done quite a lot of um, standard transdermal robotic surgical work in cancer. So this is a benign condition where a patient needs to have some mandibular gland removed for uh, chronic sal adenitis. So the traditional way would be to make an incision on the skin um, to access the superficial parts of a U-shaped gland from the skin and then once you've done that, you then remove the deep part of the gland, which is more in the superficial aspect of the pore of mouth. Um, the problem with this approach is that you have the marginal mandibular nerve, which is located quite close to the lower border of the mandible. So traditionally, the incision is placed two finger breaths below uh, the lower border of the mandible with hopes that you would have avoided the marginal mandibular nerve. But sometimes the marginal mandibular nerve can be uh, random, and despite the measures that you've taken, you can still injure the nerve. The second problem is that um, some, sometimes these um, scars heal quite um, badly. And for some people, they can develop keloid scars. It can be very difficult to manage the situation. Um, and the best way to do this is to avoid it completely. So that it avoids making any incision in the um, neck. So what we would do is we would um, undertake the procedure by accessing um, the gland not through the outside, externally through the skin, but in, um, through the mouth transorally. So seeing that the gland here is simply underneath the mucosa, what we would do is to make an incision in the floor of the mouth, having moved the tongue out of the way. So the procedure involves making a cut through um, the floor of the mouth using uh, monopolar cautery. Um, this is my first case um, that I've done this procedure. Um, you can see um, we were still developing this technique, but the technique at this point involved um, removing the sublingual gland, which is this gland here, uh, because by removing this gland, you would define the position of um, the sublingual um, submandibular duct as well as the nerve. So in this case, we are looking for the duct uh, first. The duct was uh, identified uh, here. And we've clipped the duct at the front here and at the back. And transacting that means that we have the duct attached to uh, this part of the submandibular gland. So now we want to find um, the lingual um, nerve so that um, that can then be detected. So at this stage, there will be lots of blood vessels because of the deep lingual artery, which comes um, from the lateral aspect um, into the gland. So I've removed the end of that bit here of this gland. So now what I can see hopefully is um, the nerve coming into view there. So this is your lingual nerve. We will then identify it better by putting the sluice and then putting the scoop um, and the nerve to uh, the medial aspect, so out of the way. So once we've done that, we um, have removed, we've taken this bit of the gland pull it forward, we find the mylohyoid and pull it forward. So here's a retractor that's pulled the mylohyoid forward. And by pulling the mylohyoid forward, we are exposing the front end of the superficial gland in the neck. So I'm now removing, um, dissecting this um, bit away from um, the front end. Um, and hopefully what I will meet next would be the lingual, or, sorry, the facial artery, which we would traditionally transect um, in the approach. So that's, yeah, your lingual artery, your, your um, facial artery. So the facial artery is then preserved. The, the gland is slowly dissected away from the tissue. Um, so what's now left is the back end of the gland that's quite close to the nerve, which you can see the nerve is there. So I'm just dissecting the tissue away from the nerve and finally removing the gland completely. So that's the defect, we place surgica, and then we go ahead and close uh, the floor of mouth incision. Finally, um, I'd like to just highlight um, a case that I did together with my um, fellowship director, Josh Lubeck at Baltimore. So when you have the robot, the robot gives you the added um, joker in the, in the pile of, um, cards. So when you have a problem and you can't solve it the normal way, the robot gives you the opportunity to think outside the box for a creative solution. So we have a case of a patient who has had um, significant um, mouth cancer. 
has had radiation as well as bilateral net dissection. So he's come back several years later with osteoid necrosis involving most of his mandible bilaterally. So um, he had symptoms and um, for a long time um, and has come to the point where he cannot live his life with any joy. So he's asked us to remove his jaw. Um, clearly, we don't have any adoption because generally speaking, we would like to treat this condition as conservatively as possible. There are problems with this because of his bilateral neck dissection. It means that if we were going to reconstruct this jaw after removing it, um, we wouldn't have any vessels in the neck for us to um, attach any um, blood vessel with bone if we were going to reconstruct this with a free flap. But anyway, um, what we did was we went ahead and planned the operation using um, computer-aided design and manufacture um, by identifying the area of where we were going to make the cuts. We created special cutting guides to precisely locate this. Um, and then we looked at the fibula and chose the correct fibula with the correct um, length of vessel and designed the fibula so that the fibula, the straight bone of the fibula can then be osteotomized or we say cut. Uh, to take two triangles out from this long bone so that the bone can then be um, reassembled into a U shape from a long single um, straight shape mandible. What we did was that we knew we could get the vessel uh, vein that we could get from the arm. The cephalic vein we can take from the arm and then brought back into the neck, what we call up, turning, turning up the cephalic um, vein, but it's the artery that's the problem. So the nearest artery is um, the artery called the internal mammary artery, which is located behind the sternum in the breastbone. So we didn't want to crack the breastbone in order to find this, so we got the robot out and we said, let's find the internal um, mammary artery. And once we found it, we will bring it up into the neck um, so that then we can attach the peroneal artery, which is the artery that comes with the fibula. Um, to the internal memory so that it gets its own blood supply. So that's what we did. So um, here you can see the vessel. We've brought the internal memory artery upwards, um, the cephalic turn up from the upper limb, and then you can see that the mandible now is shaped into the U shape with a titanium plate holding um, and stabilizing um, the individual osteotomized um, fibula fragment. Um, at the end of the procedure, this is how the patient looks like. You can see that um, the mucosa that's remained has been stitched to the skin. Um, on the um, right side of the patient, there's a skin that's uh, covering the bone. And on the right side, you can see that, uh, on the left side, you can see that the, the muscle, the peroneal muscle is used to line um, the area above the bone. Um, this is the man three years post-op. You can see his chin has got a really good face. His chin is um, a present. He's got symmetry of his face. And if you look inside the oral cavity, the muscle has now fully mucosalized into normal appearing mucosa, and so has the skin. We took a CT scan three months post-op at that stage, and you can see how the bone has integrated into the position which we had planned uh, preoperatively. If you thought that was fantastic, here's another slide taken two years later. Um, he's definitely healed. Um, the bones have all melded together. Um, he's been able to have implants placed into the fibula bone and on top of the implants, a, a framework to be formed that he can have dentures. He can now have steak. And at 10 years post um, treatment, he leads a very good quality of life. And this is the ultimate um, achievement for any head and neck surgeon who does head and neck cancer because what you want is you want an alive patient who's free of cancer and has good quality of life. Uh, finally, before I move on, um, I want to talk about um, the robotic system's um, ability to be a unifying platform for other digital um, technology that provides information um, to you as a surgeon uh, to, for you to be able to do the procedure. So, um, as we know, in order to cure cancer, we need to remove the cancer completely, which means that we've got to get good, clear margins without leaving any cancer behind. Um, the problem with head and neck cancer is that 
there is field of cancerization, which means that um, the entire mucosa of the upper aerodigestive tract, which has been exposed to the same risk factors such as smoking and alcohol and even viral infection, um, have the same ability to become cancerous. So you can develop cancer at any point within the continuous oral mucosal surfaces covering the upper aerodigestive tract. And if that is the case, and if this mucosa is unstable or um, already turned into cancer, but they appear fairly normal appearing to the naked eye, then if we didn't include that as part of our resection, we would be leaving behind cancer unbeknown to us, um, which could affect the patient's prognosis later on. So um, there are certain di digital technological um, equipment that can help us to identify more clearly, more accurately, these areas that are difficult to determine to the naked eye. So here I, in this slide, I have got um, an, an ultrasound probe um, which can measure depth of um, tumour, um, but also how close the depth of the tumour is to surrounding structures. And I've also got the narrowband imaging, which is supplied by the Olympus endoscope. So the narrowband imaging um, is a technology where the scope um, provides a special light, um, which interacts with um, structures in, um, that, that's being um, hit by the light. So in the case of the oral cavity, so the oral mucosa interacts with the narrowband imaging. So the structures, um, abnormal structures in the mucosa appear differently. The pattern of the blood vessels also appear different. So by recognizing the different appearance of the oral mucosa when it is shined by the narrowband imaging, you can determine more accurately if the area of mucosa, which would otherwise appear normal to the naked eye, as being abnormal with the narrowband imaging. So um, here is a video which um, I'll demonstrate this. Let's see. Okay, so this is a tonsil cancer. So um, before I start, I normally examine the tumor uh, so that I can determine the margins. So we've used the narrowband imaging here. So this is how the narrowband imaging would look like if we were to shine the light, it would appear green. Um, but when you look through the scope, um, this is what you see. You see these um, interactions of the green light with the mucosa that's normal. So in the normal appearing mucosa, you would see normal appearing vessels like this. But in abnormal mucosa, you can see a different kind of vessel pattern um, when it interacts with a narrow band. So here you can see it is abnormal over there. And here it looks very normal. So by using this narrow band imaging with um, the robotic system on Tile Pro, um, I'm able to use the robotic instruments um, with the input from an external digital technology equipment, I can determine more accurately the peripheral margin of the cancer. So here we are at the tongue base, and that's the retromolar here, the wisdom tooth socket. And I'm just joining up the tissues. Uh, I won't normally take this much tissue, but because of the narrowband imaging, um, it seems to suggest that all of that is abnormal otherwise. So now that I'm happy with the peripheral margin, and obviously there is the deep margin. So the deep margin of the tonsil can potentially be the internal carotid artery, which you saw earlier on. So I have put the probe onto the robotic instrument, and I placed the, um, robot, the tip of the ultrasound onto the, um, onto the tonsil cancer. So now I can measure the depth of the cancer, and also I can see the blood vessel how close the blood vessel is to the deepest part of the cancer. So in this way, I can determine how much um, margin um, that's um, safe for me to be able to deliver for this case. So a clear margin is anything more than five millimeters free. So if there is only three millimeters of normal tissue from the deepest part of the cancer to the carotid artery, I know that I cannot deliver a five millimeter clearance margin. So that helps me explain to the pathologist about how close um, the margins are and whether or not I need to go in and remove some more or not. So this is information is quite useful. So here I, I know my depth um, of um, surgery. So I'm placing um, 
um, the tissues, um, uh, clips, adequate clip, clipping, and then I can be confident knowing that I'm not actually quite close to the carotid artery because I know roughly where it is based on the ultrasound finding. So this kind of technology um, can be used with um, other um, um, digital um, technology, for example, with navigation um, that's currently being used for um, neurosurgical procedures. Okay, and finally, innovation on the actual robotic system itself. So uh, this is usually done by um, the Da Vinci robotic system um, owners or intuitive surgery. So intuitive surgery have improved their robot. So um, one problem we have with the robot, even though it can't give access all the way down to the larynx, but in the hypopharynx area, because of the anatomy, it's still very difficult for um, the robotic system to get to this area transorally. You can see because of the rigid instrumentation, it's a fairly straight arm that goes down a funnel. So it comes to a point where all the instruments actually um, merge or diverge into a point. And when you reach that point, you can't actually go any further because um, um, of the configuration of the transoral approach. So because of that, this area in the hypopharynx is very difficult to, to achieve um, and to get clearance even to see for that matter. So um, this is an area where, you know, minimal invasive surgery would be very, very useful because this is an area where you, it would affect swallowing quite significantly. So in order to overcome, um, you need um, instruments that can articulate um, so that it can overcome um, the acute angulation that we find in particularly in the hypopharynx area. So um, the Da Vinci um, system has come up with the latest model, which is called the single port system. So if you remembered, the robot has four arms and it's a multi-port system and each port goes in separately. What they've done is they've merged all the three um, instrument arms together with the robot into a single port. So it comes out from this single opening here. And when it comes out, you can see it then separates like Medusa's arms, uh, Medusa's hair. So you've got the camera, which is also multi-articulated and it can do the snake-like approach like this. And then you've got the instrumentations that also have multi-articulated um, surfaces. Um, not just at the wrist, but also the body of, um, of the instrument. So this means that it overcomes the problem because you can put the instrument all the way straight down up to that point, and then they come out from the port into the multi-articulated um, movements, which means that they can access this area quite nicely. Uh, this slide shows how we use the data output from the robotic camera um, by experimenting um, with um, the use of VR headsets. So um, the data output from the robot, um, from the right eye and the left eye, um, was um, harvested and then we used a software which is freely available on the internet um, to manipulate these images. Um, and then to use the images that we've manipulated on the software to visualize this using cheap accessible VR headsets for trainees to use. Um, to experience and to learn about the surgery by viewing the entire surgery in three dimension. Because if we, without this, um, the trainee would be sharing the same image as my assistant by looking in a 2D monitor. Um, the other alternative would be to buy another um, surgeon's console for the sake of letting trainees view it. So that VR um, headset costs £10 on the internet whereas the um, surgeon's console would cost uh, more than half a million pounds um, for it to be doing the same thing that the VR headset that costs 10 pounds would do. So this is quite exciting. We uh, managed to do this um, when we were waiting for the patient to be put to sleep under GA. Looking further afield, there are still many questions about how we can improve training, and education of future surgeons where robots will become more commonplace than it is at the moment. How can we also further improve our precision and the accuracy of cancer surgery, seeing that um, the radiological advancements mean that we can get more precise imaging 
and this can be the basis of more precise surgery. Um, and how can we execute the surgery with more precision if we know that the images can be precise um, by navigation surgery? So um, if we can't integrate all these systems, then the next final hurdle would be, can we program a robot to undertake the procedure from start to end? Can we program a robot to scope the patient, find the area of abnormality, and then undertake surgery? So all these are quite possible. With artificial intelligence, um, this is a dream. Um, but also we have to be careful because if we can do this, then what is the point of having humans? And finally, the last hurdle is if you were a human being and you had a choice of a robot undertaking the procedure or a surgeon, a human being taking the procedure, what would you choose? So um, that's one area of research that um, as, is being undertaken now because of more robots, more um, AI coming into um, practice. Um, it's also about patients, patients choice. Do patients feel comfortable being operated by something unfeeling or do they want a feeling surgeon? So that is the question. So in conclusion, uh, robot assisted surgery um, has changed the way we approach head and neck cancer um, by focusing on precision um, that can be obtained with the robotic system. We can expand that into scarless surgery, but also more importantly, we focus on patients' quality of life by through the preservation of function and structure by reducing or completely removing the collateral damage that's introduced with traditional open access surgery. I'd like to acknowledge the help of Joe, my robot assistant. We are a team. Um, you know, I um, work very, very well with him. We've worked together for five, six years now, and we have a telepathic um, uh, understanding of what we want to achieve. And furthermore, he's a super geek and he helps me sort my videos out. So thank you, Joe, for all your help. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Prof. It was a really a wonderful lecture. It's quite in interesting and inspiring for all of us, especially the uh, budding trainees and uh, the den dental uh, students. Uh, Prof, can you throw some light on the robotics applications in dentistry, in general dentistry, from our undergraduate students? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think they, there are some robots that focus on dentistry. Um, the robot system that I use that I'm most familiar with is a surgical robotic system. Um, the surgical robotic system that I use, uh, unfortunately, does not cut hard tissue. So most of the work that I do is soft tissue. Um, and I think the intuitive surgery um, company, they do know that the next kind of leap forward for the robots to be used more widely would be to have the ability to cut through hard tissue. So I think they are working on it um, for orthopedic slash jaw surgery applications. Um, but I think that, you know, cutting teeth, uh, enamel is the hardest uh, structure in, in the body. Um, but that's an area that, you know, um, potentially, you know, we can can, can look into and, and develop. Um, precision surgery, I think um, in dentistry, probably in oral and maxillofacial surgery, we are talking about placing dental implants uh, in a very precise um, position because you've got to get the angulation right, especially if you've got you know, several implants. And then for access, for example, if you're going to put in an implant in the you know um, upper uh, left, um, you know, wisdom tooth area. So that's, you know, with limited mouth opening, that can be quite tricky. So uh, I think that there are applications. Uh, it's just that it's, it's, it's not being done. And I think in the last two years, because of COVID, everything stopped. So everything is now restarting all over again. So we might start seeing more publications, um, work that people are doing quietly in some labs somewhere, uh, perhaps in China. <laughs> um you know to, to to develop these kinds of robots thank you prof or even here we can do something here uh, yeah. you know uh, i think it'd be quite exciting 
So we cannot use it right now for orthognathic surgery or TMJ problems? No, unfortunately not. Um, TMJ, um, I think the nearest I know of is that some robot in middle ear surgery. So um, if they can do surgery in the middle ear, I, I don't see why we couldn't use the robot um, for TMJ. But mainly for, uh, you know, things like um, soft tissue arthroscopy or arthroplasty rather than, you know, TMJ replacement because that would involve cutting bone. One question from our undergraduate student, Justin. He's asking about the possibility to integrate balloon robotics. Anything, even I'm not sure what is that balloon robotics. He's asking about that. Uh, pardon me, which, which robot? Balloon, balloon robotics. Mm. Uh, I don't know, I'm sorry, I wouldn't know that. Uh... Okay, okay, Prof. Uh, prof, uh, how effective is, is this in uh, neck dissection? Uh, can we do a, a radical or a selective neck dissection with this? Yeah, you can do anything. I think the people in Korea, especially because um, Koreans um, as a culture, society, they have a big taboo about having scars in the neck. Uh, it's almost, you know, you, you can't have any scars in the neck. So they have pioneered uh, many in, minimally invasive approaches um, for the neck. So I have been asked to review a paper um, submitted to the International Journal um, from a group in Korea who have undertaken a total vasectomy and bilateral neck dissection purely using the robot. And they have managed to do that and also insert a flap to reconstruct the area. And what they've done is they've compared um, the outcome in terms of length of surgery complications between the two groups of patients where they did the traditional approach, which is the open approach, versus the robotic approach. Um, and they found that actually the robotic approach didn't extend the operating time. So it shows the degree of expertise that they already have using the robot. It's not just the surgeons, but it's the entire team. So you have to get the entire team to um, work um, you know, together. So, for example, you need to dock the robot, you need to change the position of the robot. So you need um, not the surgeons to do it, but you need your team to help you uh, achieve that. So one of the criteria that we look to see whether um, uh, the team has been successful what, you know, as you progress from beginners to become an expert is the docking time. So in the beginning, the docking time can be even longer than the operation. So maybe sometimes even 40 minutes because you, you've got to get the angulation and the position of the robot right so that the robot arms go into the mouth in the correct position. Um, because what you don't want, you start the operation and in the middle of the operation, you've got to get up from the surgeon's console, go to the robot, change the position, and then go back. Because if you do that, that you are compressing the tongue because the retractor compresses the tongue. So the length of compression of the tongue means that after the operation, the tongue's going to swell up quite a lot. So when the tongue swells up quite a lot, then you have an airway problem um, and you may need a tracheostomy. So all these things um, add on to the um, morbidity for the patient. So even though you don't have big access, but you have a tracheostomy. So in the end, we think, why did I do that? So, can you, so the docking time is a reflection of how good you as a surgeon and your team work together. So if they can achieve bilateral neck dissection, total glossectomy, and insert of a flap at the same amount of time as you would do a traditional approach, then you know they, they are an expert. You can do it, but it takes time. Thank you, Prof. Uh, prof, in case of uh, skull-based tumors, can yes. we use this transoral robotics Yes, is the answer. So, for example, okay. you have um, retropharyngeal area, um, a tumor that involves the deep loop of the parotid, which um, you can access from inside the mouth, but you've also got a component um, on the outside. So, what you do is a combined approach. So, you can combine the approach from outside to remove the outer aspect of the capsule tumor and then you access inside with the robot to reflect the uh, capsule from that angle so then eventually it will come out um, completely from the outside but if you were to try to do everything on the outside what you will do is you will injure um, all the structures near the styloid process for example glossopharyngeal 
uh, vessel, um, nerve, and then you've got the uh, major blood vessels in the area which are the carotid arteries. So, so by accessing it intraorally or transorally with the robot, you can clean the cancer, the tumor from the, the tissues from the inside, and then from the outside, remove the outside, and then deliver it out from the outside. So yes, it's it's quite exciting. You know, you can do many things, um, and um, it's in the end, at the end of the day, it's a tool. Um, it's there to help you, but you need to know very well your tool because then you can push the boundaries. If you don't really know your tool very well, then you you know you, you could make a mistake uh, and be a disadvantage rather than your advantage. Okay. Well, question from Prof. Rina Rachel John from India. How would you deal with the situation of accidental transection of a major vessel and hemorrhage? Yeah, so um, in whenever we prep the patient and consent the patient, I always talk about the possibility of having to do an elective ligation of um, the artery in the neck. Generally speaking, uh, if I do a resection, um, transoral um, lateral oropharyngectomy, which is radical tonsillectomy, I would also undertake with a neck dissection. So um, generally, I do the robotic bit first and then I open the neck afterwards. Um, so the neck is prepared, um, ready to go. So if there is a major vessel bleed in the mouth because of you know, underestimation on the scan, for example, aberrant vessels that you didn't see on the scan that suddenly happened when, as you were accepting, what we would do is we would pack, um, we would stop, we would pack the um, um, vessel in the mouth and then we would access the neck and control the hemorrhage that way. Of course our surgery is done hypotensive anesthesia um, and um, so the anesthetist will give us a hand as well. So one of the other complications that's quite interesting that we all talk about uh, before we start robotic surgery is um, fire in the airway. So fire in the airway is a real possibility because as you can see the tube um, and the and the tracheal tube is very close to the area of the operation. So sometimes you can accidentally transect um, uh, the, the tube, and then because of the oxygen, um, high flow oxygen in the endotracheal tube that's meant for the patient to be breathing during the surgery, you get exposed into the into the cavity, and then you've got your electrocord tree, you can have a fire in the airway. So we go through the process of what would we do if there is an emergency, such as the fire in the airway, when there's all these instruments inside the patient's mouth. So, so we, you know, we, we go through our drill before we, we do the operation. So uh, then everybody's on their toes. So we have code words that we shout out. We can remove all the instruments within 10 seconds of the, of the word shouting of the emergency. And then we are immediately at the patient's mouth. Um, and you know, we have the procedure and how we do things. So fortunately, uh, I don't have that, that um, complication, um, either whether it's massive bleeding at the time of the operation uh, or, um, you know, fire in the airway. Of course, there are problems that can happen post-op. So hemorrhage is one of the biggest and the most um, important complication of robotic surgery. As you can see, we haven't split the lip um, so, you know, we have to really know our anatomy inside. So um, if we leave the wound to heal by granulation or secondary intention, there's a blood clot that um, forms on the surface of the wound that we've left behind. So um, sometimes these blood clots can get infected in the mouth, as you know, is, is, um, is full of bacteria. So when you have infected clot, the infected clot can then um, cause erosion of the tiny blood vessels, which you have a lot at the back of the throat, and then they can bleed. So in that situation, we have a protocol in our hospital about how to manage um, bleeding following tours. So we classify into minor, moderate and major, and each category will have its own uh, management. Um, of course, um, the rates of catastrophic bleeding following tours is you know one percent or one to three percent so it, it can happen um it's not i would say it's you know very uncommon to rare um, especially if you electively ligate 
um, the lingual artery in the carotid uh, when you do a neck dissection following TORS. So that single step of elective, you decide from the outset before you wait for it to bleed, you ligate it uh, before you close your neck dissection, that helps with preventing catastrophic Thank you, Prof. Uh, again, uh, one more question from Prof. Reena. Again, what do you think age is, a age is a deterrent to learn robotic surgery? Even my question is also the same. De deterrent to learn my uh, robotic surgery? Yeah. Yes. First of all, you've got to have the equipment, you know, so the biggest deterrent age is for a factor. Age is not age a factor. Okay, so let's just say that, you know, you've won the lottery and you've got a robot. So um, the biggest deterrent is um, really whether you have um, access to the robot. So that was my biggest problem. Yeah. Um, that was so my next question. Uh, is there any course or training centers for our MaxFab yes. trainees or fellowship or anything? Can you throw some light on that? Yes, there are um, fellowships uh, around in the world. Uh, I think there is one center in India that offers uh, transverse robotic surgery. I do know that in um, Korea, they do have fellowships that you can get access to. In America, it may be a bit difficult because yeah, it's very competitive and they take their own trainees. In the UK, um, very few places um, have robotic uh, cases, uh, centers. The reason is because um, not many cases that you can, there are not many cases that you can practice on. So any center that does more than 30 cases per year is considered high volume. So if the surgeons, need to have at least 100 cases uh, and, and these cases are very selective you know you, you have to choose the cases very well not all cases are suitable for robotic surgery okay thank you so much prof thank you so much for joining with us we had a nice time with you wonderful mm -hmm. time with you thank you so thank you so much thank you thank you viewers for joining with us thank you all see you all in the next webinar series thank you bye bye